My name is Suzanne Shoemaker and I am the founder and director of Owl Moon Raptor Center. We started back in 2002, so we're, this is our 20th anniversary plus year. It was pretty much just me and the birds for a long time, um, but I was only getting a few birds in at, you know, and I never really had more than a, one or two at a time. And uh, it, was a, it was a much smaller organization back then. But it grew um, because there was a lot of need for it, apparently. There is a lot of people out there uh, finding birds of prey, and they're injured. And we, uh, we started receiving more and more. And now we are receiving, oh, this year we received over 500 birds of prey. So we've grown a lot since the days of just a few at a time. My name is Tina Lunson. I'm a wildlife rehabilitator. I've been doing this um, first as a volunteer in 2012 and up till now 2023. I've been at Owl Moon for four years now working with raptors. We do a whole lot of different things for different birds depending on their needs and uh, when they come in we do an intake examination. We have to you know do a thorough exam to determine what the condition is that the bird is suffering from. Yeah, right wing seems a little bit. Um, they may have neurologic symptoms. They may have fractures. They may have um, head and eye trauma. There's all kinds of um, conditions we can find them in. Body condition. Oh, yeah, she's a chunk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> four. Her, yeah, she's a four. There's no question. <laughs> looks pretty good. I mean, she's, she's fairly symmetrical there. How do you get into a mailbox if you can't fly? Climb the post? <laughs> they found her in a mailbox? Yeah. Special delivery. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas Day. Oh, wow. Actually, it's Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Change your name to Jesus. 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 <laughs> well, they come in because of people and, and what they do and where they live and how they live and there's you know everything is related to people because the people have such an impact on the environment um, and especially in this area we are in a you know suburban urban area and there there's people in everywhere you look and houses and windows and hazards uh, of all kinds. I would say almost every bird that we get in has, uh, I'd say probably 90, 95 to 98 percent of the birds, uh, or even 99 percent of the birds. Sometimes I feel like it's 100 percent of the birds. They fly into windows, they get hit by cars, they get poisoned by people, their dogs and cats chase them and hurt them. Entanglement and netting uh, or fishing line, poisons from lead or rodenticide. People just go into their backyards or fed up with a bird making noises and shoot them a couple times. Hunters and fishers use lead and lead is poisonous to anything who ingests it so that includes all waterfowl. A soccer net in your backyard for your kids, trampoline netting, power lines, uh, the cars are of course a, a huge factor. There are also glue traps, which she really should be outlawed. They're a slow, agonizing death. We have a great horned owl with us currently who was tangled in a soccer net, um, which typically don't see soccer nets in the wild, so they are not sure how to free themselves, and by panicking, can make the whole situation worse. Uh, everything is a hazard for these birds. And a lot of these never come into rehab. for lead here? I did have a lead testing kit, but I don't have it now because everything's expired and they... She's seizing. Okay, okay, let, let go of the beak, not the head, but the beak. 
knocks her out. But she does wake up pretty quick. She'll be on her feet again in about three hours <laughs> or less. It just gives her a little bit of a break. Yeah, it's just awful to watch her. You could feel her jerking. I feel like this time of year, the hunting season has been in swing for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's everywhere, yeah. Yeah. Well, because these guys don't, they're not necessarily all guys, but the hunters don't bury the gut piles yeah. like they're supposed to. And there's non-lead alternatives, too, that are really good that they won't use. Really no, they don't. Oh, oh, oh. Don't fight me, okay. Plenty of space. Mm -hmm. Give yourself a good tail. Yep, and then snip the tail. The other one through the palm. Mm-hmm. I'll release the bird and kind of watch how she's flying, do an evaluation. Ellen's going to work the line, and it's her job to bring the bird down safely when I say so. So I'll say, okay, bring her down, and Ellen will pick up the line and start applying gentle pressure, which tells the bird, hey, start coming down. Okay. If somebody is going out soon, you need to... <laughs> like, that was not impressive. Okay, we're not even going to call that one. That was, uh, that was a trial, right? That was a warm-up. So we take feathers from a donor bird of the same size. We determine that by wing cord, and then we'll harvest the feather and put these wooden pegs, whittle them so that they fit just perfect in there. And then what'll happen is Suzanne will, will cut off the broken feather on the bird and replace it with this one. All right. All right, so now we're gonna glue it. So you want it snug, but not too snug because she feels it then, as you can see. Next feather is the last one. That's the last one on this side, so now I need you to just monitor. Honey. Little sweater on. Look at it. <laughs> Look at that face. As if they couldn't get any cuter. <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah. Square. 176 <laughs> with the with the sock. <laughs> yeah, send us your professional ones. <laughs> Wow, she's 938.5. She's a big girl. 938. Wow, that's bigger than Jillian. Yeah, she's big. Nice. <laughs> I'm big and I'm mean. <laughs> it's good when they're feisty, though. It's good for them. <laughs> it's hard for us. Yeah, there's certain birds, in particular, the barred owls and the um, and the red-shouldered hawks have benefited from some of the habitat changes that made them able better able to compete with other raptors. For example, a red-tailed hawk doesn't tend to want to nest uh, in suburban yards, whereas a red-shouldered hawk will nest in a suburban yard. The population has grown in this area because they can compete better for nest sites with uh, 
with red-tailed hawks than they used to. And so there are a lot of red-shouldered hawks around here, and there's a lot of barred owls for the same reason. They adapt well to suburban yards as far as nesting habitat goes. But then they also come in here and injured in great numbers because, first of all, there are a lot of them, and second of all, because there are a lot of hazards for them in these yards. This is Sooty Sita. The uh, wounds one is from climbing out of the chimney. That's one of them. There's one on the other side matching from, you know, hitting his wrists on there. And then there's uh, worn talons. See how they're dulled? Short and dull. What gives them an, an advantage in some respects um, also is a hazard for them in a lot of other respects. He got you a new home. Yes. He found you a home. You're going to Ohio. That's going to rock your world. What will we do when our afternoons aren't with Pettit? sad we shall be. I think the only real way to keep raptors in particular from getting injured by human interference or human structures is to leave their area wild. I mean, as soon as we put up things that interfere with their lives and how they hunt and how they live, then we're, we're giving them a very dangerous kind of uh, route to run. The, for example, the netting thing, you know, you don't think about that. Uh, but if people become aware of the fact that that can be a hazard, they might take that netting down at night or when their kids are not playing with it and, um, and make it safer or cover it with a tarp or something like that to make it safer. Only recently have buildings started being built or retrofitted so that their uh, glass does not reflect light in the same way. It reflects the light, it reflects the, um, the sky, it reflects vegetation that's around. So birds think that they're flying into a tree and in fact they're getting their necks broken. But there's so many ways that with education, I think uh, most people would be concerned enough to change the ways that they do things. But large swaths of areas need to be left wild, not just a tree here and there. It takes 10,000 caterpillars to raise one baby songbird to adulthood. So if we're killing all of the insects, we're also killing the birds. We do have to play our part in not causing harm to wildlife. So I do see things turning around somewhat. More people are being made aware and I think more people care now about wildlife. I think more people are alarmed and it is alarming um, about the state of things that includes climate change and the things that are affecting people as, as well. So I do have hope for the future. I think it will take work. Um, I think we all have to work towards it, and I think we all have to speak about it and, and teach others. And uh, I think it, we can we can do a good job. We can save the things that are here and allow them to grow in the, in the places that are appropriate for them. And um, that would make the world a better place for all of us. This is Hernandez. He was he was found at the um, or the environment no, the Department of Depart Energy. Department of Energy, yeah, in Germantown, and we are releasing him right here in Boyd's because we're close to the Germantown where he lives, which is more city, and we're gonna hope he stays in the country. <laughs> um, okay, we're ready. ready to go. I think. Okay. Yep. I'm going to be sitting there in the sycamore tree when we get back. Yeah.